Hi there, my name is Curtis Poe, better known as Ovid to many people in the Perl community, and today I'm going to talk to you about my attempts to bring modern OO into the Perl core. Note that is spelled C-O-R on this slide. That is not a typo, that is the name of the actual project, and you'll understand a bit more about that in a moment. As for myself, I'm with all around the world. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ovid Perl. Uh, if you need to, you can email me, Ovid at allaroundtheworld.fr. And amongst other things, you possibly know about TauStation.Space, the narrative MMORPG that we're building in Perl. A lot of fun. Highly recommend you go out there and try it. And it's completely free to play and runs it about browser and very accessible. But enough of that. We're going to talk about core. And when I first came up with the idea of trying to get modern OO into the Perl core, I was actually picking up the work of Stephen Little. Uh, he's been trying to do this for quite some time. But he's been doing it alone for a long time. No one's really been helping him out, and that's unfortunate. And he stopped, because after a while, you get burnt out. But he's done some great work, which has been a beautiful foundation for me to build on. Except when I pitched it to Sawyer when he was a pumpkin, he was looking at it a little bit differently, um, a little bit more than what I was thinking about. And I realized that I had an opportunity, particularly when I found out about Pearl 7, to do more than just a slightly cleaner syntax. And in fact, the way I like to describe it today is good enough is not good enough. We shouldn't settle for something which is okay. We need to have something which is excellent and a powerful foundation to build on. And core, I believe, will actually get us that. First, however, I wanna talk about terminology. Uh, specifically, there's two pieces of terminology you need to be aware of. One is slots. That's simply where the object data is stored. In Perl, we often use what's called a blessed hash reference in order to store our object data. So the slots would simply be the key value pairs inside of the object. Attributes, in this case, are special modifiers which can apply to those slots to augment the behavior, such as providing a reader attribute so people out so code outside of the class can actually read that. That's all the terminology you need to worry about, except for the name, Karina. Karina is the long name of this. Karina was a woman that the poet Ovid wrote uh, love poems to, and I just happened to think that that was very nice when it was shortened to core to fit in there. Many people have pointed out that the name core is a little bit confusing if we're talking about putting core in the core, so just call it Karina if you want to, and don't worry about that. But to understand where we're coming from, I want to talk about value first. Um, so why a picture of a pizza on the screen right now? Well, let's say you want to open a pizza joint in a town, but they already have a pizza joint and you need to beat the competition. So you're thinking about different ways. You know, Do I want to offer my pizza for a lower price or do I want to provide a better quality pizza? Turns out economists can actually answer that question. They've learned a long time ago that if you offer a lower price, something's perceived as being cheap, of lesser value. It doesn't matter what the quality is, if it is cheap, it is considered to be poor. So actually the price versus value debate shouldn't even be a thing. You always want to go on value. And any business person would tell you, if you're selling something on value, you're going to do a better job. Back when I sold cars, one of the things they hammered into our brains again and again, your happiest customers are the ones who paid full price for the car. And it was true because they were sold on value. So let's talk about the price versus value debate for Pearl. Um, what's the price of Pearl? Uh, just the learning curve. It's completely free. Uh, it's not encumbered by a difficult license, so you just need to learn the language. And it's really not the hardest language to learn. Beginning Pearl is fairly simple. Um, but what's the value for Pearl? It's not available jobs anymore. Um, those are shrunk. There's still a lot of Pearl jobs out there, but it's not nearly as robust as it was, say, 15 years ago. Data science and AI are taking over much of the world, and Perl doesn't have much to offer there. We have great stuff with our CPAN testers, powerful Unicode support, great regexes, but those are, those are marginal things, which isn't the universal value that everyone is looking for. No one reaches for a language saying, gosh, I hope they've got a brilliant testing community behind it. That's not what they're thinking about. Object-oriented programming, that's interesting because most developers after a while get into object-oriented programming and they want to learn how to make it work better for them. This is a powerful value that applies to many, many developers and we can offer. So a new developer, 
how do I write object-oriented code in Perl? You can fall back on blessing references and what the heck is that. But today, we, we tend not to do that. Instead, first of all, you grab a CPAN client. Why, why, what? Okay, that's not the big of a deal. We're, we're used to installing extensions all the time, but for something which should be in the language itself, that's a little bit odd. Then you have to pick an object-oriented system. Wait, what do you mean I have to pick one? Well, just, just pick one of those. And then we tell them, no, don't, don't choose the ones they actually chose. So you tell them moose or moo or something like that, and then the build fails after 15 minutes because you're getting an obscure error message, like you got an undefined instead of an empty string. What does that even mean anyway? And then you tell the developer, look, just force the install. And that's awful. When you come to a language, you want to learn how to do the things that you want to do. And when you have to jump through all of these extra hoops in order to get there, it's awful. Everyone wants OO, not everyone, but most do. And there's a steep learning curve, learning about installing it and which OO system to choose, and it's a mess. And most of the OO systems we have out there on the CPAN today are broken. Um, they're not always broken because of the limitations of the author's imagination. Sometimes it's limitations of Perl itself. But instead, we need something a little bit more. Um, but the situation we have now is quite often I go into a client and many times they have their own in-house OO system. So now, instead of leveraging my knowledge of the language, I have to spend time learning the quirks of their particular system. The more times we have to learn the quirks of something outside of the core of the language or should be in the core of the language, we're dividing up our knowledge, and that's not a good thing. I want to go into a client and hit the ground running as quickly as possible with standardized tools, and that's kind of hard to do when I'm going in there and you chose that OO system. Well, fun. And for the record, bless is not the value that you are looking for. Absolutely not. That's Bless is kind of like the assembler for OO language. It's the down at the very basics where you can put everything together yourself. It's not always bad, don't get me wrong, but that's not what we want for a new developer. We want them to get up to speed with something powerful. And it turns out we've got something kind of similar with Moose and Moo. They changed everything. They dominated the OO field in Perl because they were so powerful and so good, but they're not in core. And so that's the question, what should be in core? And that's what I want to address right now. So most of these object systems are incomplete. Uh, many of them, uh, they provide you getters and setters and maybe a default constructor, and that's it. Uh, effectively, what you do is you're treating objects like structs with behavior attached, which is how many people describe object oriented programming, and that's wrong. Sometimes it's right, but it's not universally true, which is why I say it's wrong. So we don't want to be good enough. We want to be better than, and this is terribly important. And then there's another reason why we want something in the core, because this, I was debugging a performance problem with my client, and the top 15 slowest subroutines, they all happen to be related somehow to Moose or Moo, or the mop, I should say, in this case. And that's frustrating. I don't want to have to keep dealing with stuff like that all the time. So we need to stop with this idea of what's the smallest thing we can possibly do to get a little bit of extra value. Let's go for the gold. Let's really push ourselves and make something wonderful. And I think we can. So core is a proposal to add modern OO to the Perl core. And we want it to be easy. And I want it to be more powerful than many other programming languages out there. And I've done a lot of research into this, a lot of work with other languages, trying to understand how they do OO. But it also has to feel like Perl. Now, we've gotten a lot of this done. Uh, we have a grammar for the basics of Perl. We have a, a, here's another grammar just specifically for how the methods will be designed. You don't need to worry about those. Um, the grammar of Core is largely done. There's still a few corner cases we're trying to settle. Uh, the semantics are largely done, but there's some difficulties there that we have to nail down. Uh, and we need to come to an, a minimum viable product that we could actually get into Perl and find out if, you know, Perl 5 porters will accept it. So we need to understand first the design considerations that I went through in order to create Core. After I had that talk with Sawyer, and he said, don't worry about the implementation. Design something wonderful. So I, I went for it. So first was simply easy things should be easy and hard things should be possible. That's, that's Perl. 
That is the heart of Perl for a long time. So there's nothing radical about that. And then small systems should be easy to build, but large systems must have greater safety. I hit this all the time with clients and I go in there and they're slinging data all over the place and it's very hard to validate that data. It's very hard to ensure that your objects are behaving correctly. You have mutable objects, so you pass an object around, something changes its state and something else doesn't know it and things go boom. So we want to make it easier to build safe, large systems. And this is a lot of work, has been a lot of work, but trying to decouple data from the accessors, from the constructors, the, the has keyword that you have for Moose and Moo. And we want to encourage smaller interfaces so that you don't, uh, we don't offer promiscuous data. We don't offer too many things. Uh, I won't go into that too much right now, but if you're familiar with OO design, uh, you understand why that's valuable. We also want to cater to new developers. That is extremely important. And when I say new developers, I don't just mean new to Perl, I mean new to programming. We need to have something easy. So when you're looking at this line, this is from Moo, has name is RWP. What the heck is RWP? It means read, write, protected. Great, what does read, write, protected mean? For core, has name and it has a reader. Once you understand core, it becomes very simple. You don't have to remember anything. It's not hard to figure out what that does. So this is part of the thing. We're trying to make this simple and easy and still feel like Perl. As a counterexample, Paul Graham, when he created ARC, he wanted it to cater to experts and only experts. He didn't want to have to hold the hand of the newbies, so to speak. And as a consequence of that, ARC is dead. It was hard to pull in new experts, uh, new people to the language, because it was daunting in many ways. Uh, he didn't make it simple, unfortunately. Uh, and you can go out to their message boards now for development. You can see not too many people are touching it anymore. Aside from Hacker News, nope, that's it. Arc is gone. Core, however, it's very opinionated. It's my opinions, sorry. Uh, I started that, though I've been taking a lot of feedback from the community. It's very Perl-ish. It does require some evolution to the Perl language. And it's designed to be practical designed on years of experience, working in companies, and also lots of time reading books on object-oriented design. Uh, the steering council is receptive to the idea. We possibly will have some issues there later on, but they're receptive. Uh, Stephen Little's talked about building a transpiler so Core could work with older versions of Perl. Uh, Paul Evans has been hacking on ObjectPad, which is been able to test bed a lot of the ideas. And one of the interesting things about that is object construction currently is a little bit slower than Core Perl, but the object runtime is much faster. So that's, and that's without his attempting to optimize anything. So that's just fantastic news right there. Uh, we definitely welcome community input. You can go out to ircperl.org, uh, the core channel, uh, or ovidgithub or github.com slash ovid slash core, and there's a wiki there that you can read. You can also read some of the issues and add comments there if you prefer to participate that way. All the core syntax you're about to see is highly speculative. So it's mostly there, but it's some of it's going to change. I know that. And forget about the data types. Initially, I want, wanted data types to be in core version 1. The problem, however, is Dave Mitchell's working with data types for function signatures. We also possibly will eventually need data types for variable declaration. And the question of, you know, are we typing the variable or are we typing the data? How is that going to work? Um, and we're also going to need data types inside of core. So we don't want to have separate data type systems. So that's going to have to be unified across all of that. That's way too much work right now. I can't do that. So I'm not. But let's talk about the evolution of OO and Perl. Now, <clears throat> prior to Moose uh, came out in 2006, it was all over the place, and it was a mess. Uh, Moose tried to create something standard. This is from Moose.01. This looks a lot like Moose today. Uh, it didn't automatically incorporate strict warnings. Uh, the int, you can see, uh, you can see right up here, int was actually a function call. That was something that was exported into your name namespace. Um, but most of that looks pretty much like we what we expect to see in today. Uh, and here's a point class. 
<clears throat> I'm using a point class because there's other stuff I'm going to be able to show you later in relation to core, and you can see the evolution easily with this. You can see we have an x, we have a y, uh, and here we have a clear to clear these values. Very simple. You've seen this before. Moose has a number of issues, which I won't go into all of them, but uh, Stephen Little in his attempt to bring modern OO to the Perl core uh, eventually came up with Moxie, which is a powerful OO system, much cleaner, uh, runs faster than Moose. Here's how you declare slots. Remember I mentioned that term in terminology earlier, slots, uh, your data, uh, and assign it default values. Here's how you declare the accessors for those slots. In this case, they're both read-only. And then there's this not safe work bit. This is, no, we, we don't want this. We're, we're exposing the internals. Uh, it's just a blessed hash rec. It doesn't need to be that. I don't like that. And when I saw this, I was like, I like what Moxie's trying to do, but I do not like the syntax at all. So what can I do to fix this? Here's what I have. Class point has x, y. New means it's required in the constructor. Each of those has a reader, so you can call object x, object y. We also have default values of 0 and 0 for each of those. Because we have default values, it means even though you pass it to the constructor, you can pass it to the constructor. It's not required because it'll fall back to the defaults. And then if you want to clear those values, you just set them to 0. It's clean. It's simple. So you can see Moxie over here, and then we have Core over here, how much cleaner that is. Now, Moose was great, but it's a bit slow. That's part of the reason why Moo came about. Um, it does have some bad affordances in there. It encourages your data to be promiscuous, which I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, it's clumsy for a lot of the use cases that we want, and I will show more about that. Uh, and Raku has some great ideas, but Raku is a different programming language. And trying to backport some of the ideas from Raku to Perl has already proven problematic. And there's a number of things with list flattening and stuff which make some of the data declaration complicated. So we're not going that route. But let's look at Moose. We're going to look at has, the way you declare a slot. It handles your slot declaration and it has attributes, which in a different sense, which is a heavily overloaded term, handles data types, coercion, delegation, clears, predicates, blah, 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 blah. It handles all this stuff. You want to talk about an overloaded function, which is doing way too much. And core has handles slot declaration. That's all. That's it. You have a slot of data in your object, nothing else. It makes it simple. It makes it easy to reason about. So let's get a little bit more deep into this. And we'll think about a simple object. Uh, we have a customer object that has slots of name, birth date, and an optional title, doctor, is, or whatever. Uh, and then we have some methods. You can get the full name, which is a name prepended with a title, uh, and predicate methods. You know, are they old enough to vote, drive, etc., cetera, et cetera. So here's the three slots, title, name, and birth date. You can see all three of those right here. And then we have our methods, the full name and the predicate methods that I mentioned earlier. This is very simple, very clear. Um, this is standard moves. There's nothing unusual about this. Why did I declare all of those read only? Read only is certainly a problem. As imagine this, if Ovid is old enough to vote, my date equals Ovid birth date, and then somewhere in the depths of your code, you set the birth date to yesterday which means now you've mutated the state of the object, and even though you said it was old enough to vote, it no longer is. It's hard to guarantee the correctness of the system if you check to see if it was correct, and then you change it to an incorrect state. So because we said birth date was read-only, this will throw an exception. That's a nice way to protect you. Except you pull out your date object, and then date set year to last year. You can work around the read-only because, in this case, the date time object is mutable, which is unfortunate. By the way, this is, this is a real-world problem, and it causes people problems all the time because when you're passing around this, these objects, they're references, which means something way off in your code over there changes the state of that object. You won't necessarily know. Uh, so. Ricardo Sinias has a great blog entry uh, about a real-world problem he had dealing with this. Uh, and datetime moonpig and datetime x immutable are both ways of trying to get around this. And I've seen this problem crop up with 
database objects quite often, uh, ORM, a uh, class. Um, this is one of the ways you can now set, uh, for one of my clients, they inflate their daytime objects to immutable daytime objects so they don't have the case of them setting that in an unexpected fashion. This is very, very important to try and get things as read-only as possible so that you don't have this unusual action at a distance, which is very common with objects. So core, guiding principles. Immutability needs to be the default. It doesn't have to be. It's, it's trivial to make it mutable if you want to. Um, if you're writing an ORM, you do need to be able to set that data, so you can do that. But by default, immutable. So we get a new business rule. Customers must always be addressed by their title and name, if the title plus name, if they have a title. Never, ever, ever by just their name. So that's what our full name method did right over here. Um, that's title or name, and it might look like this. So my title equals self-title. You know, you grab the self-title, and if that's not true, then you just have an empty string, and then you return title concatenated to a self-name. But the problem is, yeah, we can access full name, but sooner or later someone's still going to call the name method. That violates our business rule that you must never address them as that. So you want to stop that. You want to build a safer system. So we actually want the name attribute to be private, but we don't want to pass underscore name to new. Um, so how do we handle that? Well, one way to do that is we can declare this as has underscore name, and then we pass in an init arg of name which means now if you try and call customer name, it'll blow up because that doesn't have a method like that. But sooner or later, someone's going to call it like this with the underscore. We don't have truly private methods with this system, so that's a bad thing. Well, what you can also do is you can say it's bare. There are no methods associated with it. So now you can pass in name to the constructor and have the name set, and you don't have to worry about it. And then this is how you actually get the value out of there. And nobody actually does that. No one, no one bothers. It's too much of a pain. So instead, in it, arg and bear, they're, they're kind of clever but ugly solutions. And this is partially due to how the Perl syntax, what it does and does not allow, and has conflates too many things together. So core attempts to break that. So when you're designing an object system, by default, you don't want any public data methods whatsoever. No one can read any of the data that you passed in. Expose them one by one as you need them, and that's very important, and only when you can see that that's necessary inside of your code. In Moose, that's kind of painful to do. It's a little bit frustrating. So core, private data needs to be easy, and we don't want to encourage promiscuous data. Don't hand that data out there and expose it to people when they don't actually need it. So in core, this is how we would do it. We have our name up here. Um, again, the type syntax is just for amusement purposes. You can ignore that. Uh, we say that the name is required in the constructor. So method name, if we have a title, we return title and name. Otherwise, we just return the name. Very simple, very easy, and nothing unusual about that. We didn't provide a reader for any of these, by the way. So no one can read this outside of this code. So <clears throat> let's talk about uh, the fact that some methods are expensive. And that's a little bit, we often call them attributes sometimes in uh, Moose because people are singing with these terms around way too much and it gets confusing. Um, but what if this particular attribute is extremely expensive to calculate? Well, um, again, the word attributes are overloaded. We'll ignore that. So let's say. We have a box class. We want to calculate the volume of the box. It's the height times the width times the depth. That is not expensive. If it was expensive and we didn't want to recalculate that every time we called the volume method, what do we do? We can declare a volume attribute. And we can say it's readly, which, of course, we know we want that. And we're declaring it as a num and init arg. We don't want anyone passing volume into the constructor, so the init arg, we set it to undef. Lazy, which means you don't calculate it until it's requested. Let me go back there. Build volume, return self height width. There we've got the builder, so it will be called once and only once, and then the volume will be stored internally. You don't have to recalculate it, but that's a pain. Nobody does that. 
Instead, we have the volume method. It's going to get recalculated every time. How do you do this in core? In core, hmm, volume. I've got a reader. I've got a builder. Because I don't have new, I cannot pass it to the constructor. It won't work. Instead, here's my reader, here's my builder, and I just return height, width, and depth. And it gets stored in volume, and then it's available. Great. Side by side, looking at them, you can see how Core does the same thing as what Moose does, much shorter, much easier. But let's talk about object construction. So let's show how object construction actually works. Um, here we have an example with my height, width, and depth. Um, because we have new, they are required in the constructor. Here we have name, new, but we have a default value, which means it is optional to the constructor. And here we have no new attributes, so you cannot pass that in the constructor. That's a simple understanding slots in object creation. It's very simple, very easy. Um, I want constructors to be simple. So let's uh, take a look at this. Uh, here's how we're going to have this in Moose. We have our height, width, and depth. We say box volume. That all works fine. What if we wanted to pass in uh, a single argument per box? This means it's actually a special case of the constructor. It's a cube, seven units on each side. We say the cube volume, 343 cubic units. What does that actually mean? How do we do that? Well, in Moose, we build args. If 1 equals args, that's how many args we had, then we set our height, width, and our depth to that number, and then we call the original version of the constructor, and it all magically works. I can pass that in, except that fails horribly, because you might recall Moose allows you to pass in key value pairs or a hash ref of key value pairs, which means a hash ref is a single argument. And then you wind up with this weird error, attribute depth does not pass the blah, blah, blah. What is, what's going on? What's going on is right here. We check that we have one arg, and it's not a reference. And then we can go ahead and do that. And even this is a little bit sloppy. In fact, this is what I do in my code all the time for my clients. Um, I'm just hoping this works. My args, if one equals args, then this is how I dereference it. Otherwise, I take the list. You, you don't want to have to do that. And Perl, how does Java handle this, though? Well, Java, they can actually have overloaded constructors um, so here we've got a double, double, double width, height, and depth, and then you've got the length. And it's actually pretty simple. You can call this either way, a new box with the three arguments or a new box with one argument, and it does the right thing. So looking at this, we've got this ugly mess with Moose, and Java actually makes us look verbose. Java makes Moose look bad, which is embarrassing. The downside of this, though, because Java doesn't use named arguments, you can't tell which of those are the height, width, or depth. And to me, this is a design flaw in Java. I, I do not like seeing that. Um, in core, how would you do that? S simple. Height, width, depth, new reader. Um, I have a, all of this is, you've seen this before, we've talked about this. Instead of build args, we have a construct method. We call it construct because it behaves a little bit differently from build args. Uh, if I only have one argument, then I know that's for the overloaded constructor, and I map those out to the height, width, and depth, and I just return the args. So that, it's easy. Uh, and then I have this uh, private method, build volume, which just, all of this just works exactly as you expect it. There's nothing fancy. Uh, so Moose, we have the build args, which is very funky because you have different ways you can call the constructor in Perl. Uh, in Moose, and then you have Core, which is one standard way of calling that constructor, which is what you want. Or you can just have a separate constructor called new box, and the argument's class num, class new, height, width, whatever. That makes it all very simple, and you can call it right there. But do you want to have multiple constructors, and then you have to document this is my new way of creating a constructor here? That's, no, I don't like that. So, Core is just make object construction easy. A lot of the things which are kind of tricky in Moose or Moo, dead simple in Core because we have decoupled the slot declaration from the behaviors associated with that. So now we're going to look at, uh, say, classic OO, where we're going to bless a reference. You might notice we have underscores 
before this. Why is that? People might remember a long time ago what we used to have in Perl is you would have underscores because that's the private data inside of the object you weren't supposed to reach in and grab. Today we know how silly that is. You're not supposed to touch any of that. You're supposed to go through the interface. But that was common behavior back then. This class in Moose looks like this. I've got just two attributes. It's very simple. It's very easy. Um, and here it is in core. I have my name, I have my birth date, I've got a reader for each of those. Each of those is required in the constructor. And again, the dates are for entertainment purposes only. So there is core Perl, and here's core, or Karina. You can see how much easier and simple it is to construct an object. Most of this becomes declarative now, except for the special behavior you need inside of your actual methods. So object systems, what we tend to have for Perl is many of them uh, they're just public interfaces for, you know, grabbing data, grabbing all the data, and you don't want that. Uh, Moose practically requires public methods, and you don't want that. You want to be able to hide this data away and only expose it as needed. Uh, everyone wants public methods. You just add, if you want to expose your data, just add a colon reader after your attribute, done. That's simple. So attributes for data should be easy in core. So let's look at a more complicated example, uh, something which might look closer to real world code. So here's a, a least recently used cache or LRU cache, where basically you have a set number of items inside of your cache and the items which have been least recently used are ejected from the cache when the cache fills up. So the more frequently you request a particular item, the more likely it is to be present in the cache. Uh, and they have some great uses. They're not always appropriate, but it's this, this code's too small. I know you can't read it, but that's because core Perl is going to be a little bit verbose. I could some moose. It becomes a little bit smaller. Not a lot, but it is definitely smaller. Here it is in core. Now you can see how much smaller this code has become. You can see things like... Uh, we have created, we've got a reader for it, and uh, the default value for that is time. Uh, because it doesn't have new, it just means as soon as you create this object, it'll have this value set. And we can check, you know, if LRU cache created minus time is greater than such and such a value, we could do something with this. All is, so this is like a nice non-lazy default that we have available. Uh, here we have the actual cache, which is gonna be a hash ordered object. Uh, again, we don't have new in there, so you can't set it, but we can just access this variable directly in our set method. Here we have max size. This one has a default of 20, but because it's allowed in the constructor, you can call cache LRU new max size and then set it to a different max size if you want to. And all this code's pretty simple. The only thing which is, which is non-declarative is the set method. So when we set it, if it's already in the cache, we cache, we delete it. Um, and otherwise, if cache keys are greater than max size, then we shift that off the cache. And then we set the key value. Uh, that guarantees that this key will be in the front. So when we call get, we'll, we'll know that we've got something in the cache if it's fairly recently used. So I won't go into detail, but it's it's fairly simple, fairly easy to follow, much easier. Uh, here it is in Raku. I tried doing the same thing. I was kind of curious about that. It almost behaves the same way, except it turns out the ordered hash uh, module in Raku is sorted, not ordered. Or it was at the time that I tried this. Maybe they've changed that. I don't know. But you can see, for those of you who like Raku, this is very, very similar. So has... Is, is like my. It just declares a variable. It declares a slot in this case. Uh, and again, it has attributes allowed for it. Um, so this first one, we don't allow it in the constructor. This one here, uh, it's required in the constructor because we have new with nothing else. But because here we have a default, it is, it's, can be passed in the constructor, but it's not required. Here we have a lazy builder. Here we have a reader. A reader. By the way, the builder might not be lazy. We are still defining the semantics, and it may be the case that we're going to add a cold and lazy attribute later on. Um, so, again, all this, it's simple, it's easy to read. Um, here's some more examples of the slot attributes. Um, 
We also have weak in case you need to weaken it. We have clears, we have predicate methods, uh, delegation. You can rename it in case you need it to be referred outside of the code by a different name. We do have a legal combination of builder and the equals default because equals default is kind of a synonym for builder. Um, you can't provide any duplicate attributes. And the goal of this is to make attributes as composable as possible. You can't really do this in Moose or Moo because basically you've got a hash or a hash ref and if you had like duplicates, they'll all flatten out and overwrite each other. And that's kind of unfortunate. And if it weren't for the equals default, all of the attributes would be composable. So nice, simple, easy to follow. So core should support types eventually, but it's not going to in the first version. Uh, I'm pretty certain of that, uh, simply because there's too much work to be done there. And we have to define how the types would actually be defined. Do we have has string foo, very similar to current Perl syntax, which mostly does nothing. We have this colon is a syntax, which matches the attribute syntax of everything else inside of core and is nice and easy to extend. Some people are arguing for his string. We don't know. So we're, we're punting on that. As I mentioned, Paul Evans has been working on object pad, and that's been a great test bed. And he's come to me sometimes. He's asked questions about how does X work, or I've come to him sometimes and I've asked how does X work. And that's helped us refine a lot of the ideas, and it's working very well. It's nice to see that the core concept is simple and easy, uh, but there's still a lot more work to do. Uh, it will probably, if it gets available, will be under use feature class, so that we have a guard to make sure that it's safe. And the steering committee might just veto it, or P5P might veto it. P5P might say, yeah, that's really great, but there's too many changes to the Perl core, and we just don't want to maintain it. We don't know yet. Uh, but P5P, or sorry, the steering committee is receptive to the idea, which is good. So if you go out to the CPAN right now, uh, you can play with object pad. Uh, very, very similar ideas. So this code works exactly as you would expect it to, which is a, a lovely thing. But there are some objections to core. So the first one, which I keep hitting all the time, is bless is good enough for me. We don't need anything more than bless. Uh, my response is, we're not removing bless from the core. That, that's fine. No one's proposing that. Um, and if bless is good enough for you, absolutely great. That's fine. But don't say that I have to choose something because you prefer bless. That's, that's not fine. Don't take this away from other people. Why don't we put moose in the core? Or moo? Well, moose pulls in a huge slew of modules, which would then have to be maintained. That would, is an absolute nightmare, and it does have some of the wrong affordances. Moo is a little bit easier, but the problem with Moo is you've got the meta method, where you can call make immutable on it, and that's a no-op, but if you call anything else on meta, that actually inflates the meta class, inflates your Moo object to a Moose object, which means you still have to have Moo in core, or you have to Moose in core, or you have to tell everyone Moo no longer works the way that it used to, so it's not entirely backwards compatible. And that's going to cause a lot of problems. And again, it has the wrong affordances in how the objects are constructed. Again, we have this, Moose has. It's doing way too much. And good enough isn't good enough. We have to be great. We have to be better than. And that's what I am striving for with this. Some people say we should just make this a module. OK, fine. Then we get lost. Everyone knows the problem with this. We're going to get lost in that mix. and. The XKCD cartoon, you know, the 14 competing standards. We're going to make a new one which will cover all the edge cases. Now you have 15 standards. We don't want that. It might come in handy. Uh, it might come in with Perl 7. We don't know what's going to happen with Perl 7 yet because that's been put on hold for a while while Perl governance is being restructured. Um, so pretend I didn't say Perl 7 there, but at least in Perl 7 or Perl 8, we might get rid of the feature guard and it might become standard in the language without having to worry about the experimental nature of it. But it does mean if we follow this, we can do a lot more. Um, we don't have to stop there because core introduces a new syntax. What if we also have module, some module, instead of class, some module? Uh, and inside of that, everything has a new modern syntax, such as automatically having strict warnings enabled. We could have typed signature. 
We could have multi-subs, which solve all sorts of problems, can really make your code very clean. We could have type signatures and multi-methods. You know, we can get the best of both worlds in that. We could possibly have typed variables. So core, if we're going to get in the core, the nice thing, and it ends the embarrassment of how do, you, I, how do I do OO in Perl? You don't want to explain blessing references to people. Uh, in fact, many modern developers have uh, discovered if they've learned Perl recently, many of them don't know how to bless a reference. They don't know what that is anymore. It is that bad. Object pad prototype, as I mentioned, is showing off a lot of the things we can do. Um, and it's already faster than Core Perl, except for the actual object construction. So I think that's a wonderful thing because you don't have to call methods to get the data. You don't have to reach inside uh, a reference order to get the data. It's just there. It's fast. Uh, standard OO, it's going to be easy to learn, and it's going to be better than many other OO languages. I didn't even have the time to touch on roles in this talk. I wish I could have, but I don't have the time for that. But we will probably start again with the feature guard. Use feature class. Uh, it's sparked a lot of great ideas. And it's been really fascinating working with people, trying to refine this and getting it better and better. But we need to be careful to get it right. And then core v2, what about native exceptions? What about you know, having try, catch, finally? I think that might actually go into Perl separate from core. Um, async await is, might be part of core, but I'm hoping that could go into Perl separately from core. But it could be there. Getting truly private methods, the semantics on that are complicated because, again, uh, Dealing with how the variable's typed, is it the variable or the data that the variable's pointing to, which has the bless assignment? Uh, wouldn't be a bless assignment in this case, but it's it's difficult. It's tricky. Uh, getting multi-methods in there, having a type system finally would be lovely. Um, there's all sorts of things we can do. It opens up a huge amount of possibilities. So core is clean. It's simple. You get real methods with core, not the subroutines, which have self passed as the first invocate. Uh, and then it just kind of works together. Uh, and they'll be marked as methods internally, which means the mop can understand if you're trying to call a method that you don't accidentally try and call a subroutine, which happens to have the same name. We're decoupling the data in the access as an object construction, which makes it much easier to understand or comprehend the system and to build it. We don't know what the MVP is. We're still working on that. Um, and there's a lot more work to do. And we don't know how extensible we can make it. But it is there. And I'm just absolutely delighted about that. We have much of it in place right now. So I want to say thank you very much. Obviously, this is being done differently since it's online uh, and not an in-person conference. So I won't be taking talks directly here. I'll be taking them afterwards. There are questions, I mean, not talks. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you being here.